Hello, and welcome to a talk about screenshots and automation tools. My name is Terrence Wong, and I've been at Duolingo a little over two years. And I've been in this business for about 16. However, this is my first job in mobile app, so if I approach something in an odd way, it's probably not because I'm clever, it's probably because this is my first job in mobile. If you are unfamiliar with Duolingo, we do a variety of things, but we are probably most well known for our language learning app. Actually, you know what? Scratch that. These days, we're probably most well known for our TikTok channel where we post weird videos, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the learning app. We offer over 100 courses in language learning, and all of the course materials are free. We have a lot of users, but only three automation engineers, so we are tasked with supporting a lot given a small amount of resources. In the rest of this talk, I'm going to cover how we capture screenshots and introduce a tool we have called Bird's Eye for viewing the screenshots. Then I want to talk about three projects we have for automating some of our workflows. These are string ID, button bot, and diff bot. We generate a lot of screenshots every week. So we have an app on three platforms, Android, iOS, and web. We offer our course materials in 24 UI languages, and we want to capture these screenshots in a variety of device configurations. So uh, small, small screen sizes, large screen sizes, dark mode, light mode, that sort of thing. And then on top of that, we have weekly releases. So the code is changing all the time, and we want to capture these screenshots to make sure that everything is going out in high quality. As a result, we're generating about 70,000 screenshots per week. With Sauce Labs, this is easy. But then what do we do with all these screenshots? One thing we can do is have humans look at them. So they can verify the screen layout to make sure that something is not covering something else up, or they can verify the localized text to make sure it's been translated properly. But having a human do all of these things is not something that's going to scale. Let's take a look at Bird's Eye. It is a tool that we have for displaying the screenshots. On the left pane, we can see various filters for narrowing down the screenshots we want to see. In the main panel, we have the screenshots that are being displayed for those filters. So let's see the tool in action. Let's say I want to view just the onboarding screenshots. These are the ones regarding the new user flow. And I only want to see the iOS screenshots and only in Spanish. Once I have set those filters, the main pane will be filled with just those particular screenshots. And then I can click on an individual one to get a closer look. Now we are zoomed in on a screenshot, and we can see the image here. On the right, we have an easy way to submit tickets into our bug tracking system, and this will include all of the metadata from the screenshot into the bug. So that's very convenient. And then in the top corner over there, where it says Normal View, that's a drop-down box. We can change how we display this screenshot, and I'll get into more of that later in the talk. There is a blog post for the development of Bird's Eye, this URL is kind of long, but if you search for it, it'll come up. So let's move on to string ID. We have a tool called Copycat for tracking the localized text translations in our app. Once those, once those strings are in the tool, however, and then they're imported into the app, this is not the end. The strings can be edited for various reasons. Sometimes the strings are edited because in English, they fit on the screen properly, but then in another language, it's too long and it doesn't fit. So then the localization team member would have to go in and perhaps try to shorten the string while maintaining the same context and information. Another possibility is that the translation is awkward. Maybe the translation is correct, but when it's put into the app, it's too formal for what's going on in the rest of the screen. Uh, there are other reasons like re regional differences where maybe the translation works in a certain part of the world, but it doesn't quite work in another part of the world. In the old workflow, we would have to go into the copycat tool and manually find the string that we're trying to edit. So we have, let's say we have the screenshot here, and I want to modify the button text here that says continue. In that case, I would have to go into the copycat tool and search for the word continue. However, there, there are multiple strings in the app that contain the word continue, so I don't know necessarily which string I'm editing that's going to affect this particular screenshot. So there could be some confusion there. I could edit the wrong string, and this one wouldn't change. A second issue is unintended side effects. Even if I correctly edit the text of this string in this button, I don't know what other screens use this same string and could also be affected. So if I modify this continue button, 
some other screen that uses the same string will also change, and I may not want that. Fortunately, string ID handles both of these situations. The solution we came up with was to instrument the app to display the string ID instead of the localized text itself. So in this screenshot, we can see that all the text has been replaced by string and then some number ID. And this is very convenient because we can just capture this as a regular screenshot, and we already have all of the infrastructure for doing that. So we just slot this into our regular pipeline, and it collects everything as just another uh, language, essentially. Once we have this information, we can run OCR on it to extract the ID number and the location in, within the screenshot where the string ID is located. And then once we have all of this, we can instrument Birdseye to give us a direct link from the screenshot text directly into the Copycat Tools editing tool. So let's take a look at this in action. Where it says normal view, I'm going to change that drop down to string ID view. And now I have the exact same screenshot, but all the text has been replaced by the string IDs. And I can mouse over one to get a tooltip that shows the original text so I can make sure that I'm editing the right thing. When I click on it, it's a direct link into the copycat tool, and now I can edit the string in whatever language I need to to update the text. Now I said there were two issues. The second one is the un unintended side effects. This is the one where I edit a string and I don't know what other screenshots uh, use that same string and may be affected. So this one, we're going to look at the search by string box at the top of the screen. And let's watch a demo of that. Let's say I want to edit the continue button from before. I'll search for the word continue, select the string. And now I have every screenshot in Romanian on mobile web, which contains that continue button string. So if I edit the string for the continue button, all of these screenshots will be affected. Last year, we had over 2,000 string edits in Copycat. And so this tool saved us a lot of time. Instead of having to manually do the search every time, we can go directly from bird's eye screenshots directly into the Copycat tool. And as I mentioned before, this is also very, was very easy to implement because it was built on top of our existing screenshot infrastructure. We didn't have to add anything new to, to this except for displaying the string and then OCRing the text. And then we also have bird's eye, and we just instrumented some new UI features on top of it to handle the connection between bird's eye and copycat. Now, the one downside is that this requires modifying three apps. So each app, web, Android, and iOS, has their own code base and it has their own development team. So it's expensive to have to modify the apps because then we have to talk with each team and figure out how, how this change can be done. This is a lesson that we learned that we will apply to the other projects. So let's move on to ButtonBot. We noticed in Bird's Eye that we have a recurring problem in some of these screenshots. So if we look at the two screenshots on the left here, they both have buttons where the text has run off the edge. And then these two screenshots behind me are from the web where the buttons are too short and then the text is touching the top and the bottom. And even, even Duo here is not happy about what he's seeing. Let's consider a potential solution. We could implement a neural network. Uh, this is one of those things that's popular in tech right now. But the problem here is that it requires a lot of labeled training data, which we don't have. It also requires a lot of compute time to generate the model and run the tests on it. And we also don't want to spend that amount of time. And the last thing is, it requires some amount of subject matter expertise to tune the model and, and handle neural networks. And with a team of three, we just don't have that expertise. So this is a bit heavy handed for what we want to do. And so we are going to look at something else. Let's consider what a button actually is, though. It, it's a well-defined thing. It's a wide and skinny rectangle. It is uncommon on the screen in that there's usually one, maybe two buttons on a screen. It's not a screen that's completely full of buttons, usually. There is a clear boundary around the edge of the button and the rest of the screen. And there's text inside that's centered and padded. And, and what that means is there is blank space between the text and the edge of the button. Let's look at some OpenCV magic. OpenCV is a library for image manipulation functions. And here I have a screenshot that I took just out of bird's eye. This is the original screenshot, and I've cropped the top of it just a little bit so that I can fit more onto the screen. The first thing we'll do is run canny edge detection on the original screenshot. 
And what this does is help us reduce some noise. It takes the original image and it only returns the outline of everything that it saw in that image. So in the second image here, the button is no longer a solid white button. It is just the outline of the button. And in fact, all the text that's on the screen is just the outline of the characters that were in the original, uh, in, the, in the original screenshot. But the Kenny edge detection returns a, an image that's just a bunch of pixels. So we can't really reason about this and we need to do more. In the next step, we run a contour detector on the image in the second step. And what this does is it combines adjacent pixels from the canny edge detection into a structure. And we can do more work with that structure. One of the things we can do is ask it what the area is of the space inside the structure. So from experimentation, I know that on this size screenshot, a button is approximately 40,000 to 60,000 pixels in area. Knowing that, I can go through every contour that's returned and filter out anything that's not in that range. So I'm only keeping things that are within that range and throwing everything else out, and I'm left with just the button outline and nothing else, nothing else on the screen. However, there's still very little we can do with the contour, so we have one more step, which is to call a rectangle function, which puts a box around the contour from the third step. And now we have summarized everything into four numbers the x and the y coordinate of the top left corner, and then the width and the height of the rectangle. So we've taken everything from the first screenshot and reduced it down to four numbers representing the space around the button in the last image. Now let's apply this code to an image and see what happens. This is a login page on, in Arabic on iOS, and we can see already that there's something going on with this Apple button here where there's things pushing up against the edge. So let me just zoom in on the buttons themselves. And this is the result of running the code on this image. The blue box is where the code believes the outline of the button to be. So it's pretty close. And then the red box is just the blue box, but shrunken in just a little bit. And this is where we expect there to be nothing. This is the area that should be the padding between the text and the edge of the button. And we can see in the Google link that the Google image, the logo here has intersected the red line. So we are flagging this as a potential error because there's something that's too close to the edge of the button. The Facebook button has no boxes around it because it's not being flagged. We can see pretty clearly that there's a good amount of space between the text and the edge of the button, so this looks okay. And then in the third button, the Apple button, the logo here again is intersecting the red line, and then on the other side, the Apple, the A in the word Apple is also intersecting the red line, so this is also being flagged as a potential problem. When we ran this code on our screenshots, we found a whole bunch of bugs, which is great. Here's one example. The mobile web, we can see in the button, there is text that's overrunning the edge. So this is the classic problem, and we've detected it. This is on Android, similar issue. In fact, the text here in Copycat was too long, and when it was rendered, it was truncated and not centered. When we saw this, I went into Bird's Eye to look up the history of the screenshot, and it had been showing this wrong for 17 weeks. So this had been in the field for months, and it's kind of embarrassing, but it's also pretty cool that this tool caught it the first time we ran it. And finally, in this iOS screenshot, the text was too long, but instead of running off the edge, it actually caused a line wrap, and we detected this by detecting the intersection on the top and the bottom rather than the sides. So three interesting examples of bugs found. Uh, in summary of this section, we found 11 bugs when we ran this code on our screenshots for the first time. So this is pretty impressive. Uh, even Duo is happy about that right here. And once we fix these bugs, we don't expect this to happen every week. It's not going to find 11 bugs every week. Hopefully, the incident of this happening is very rare. But it's good to know that we have this code protecting us for when it does crop up again. One thing we learned from the String ID project was that operating uh, or instrumenting the app is not very efficient. So this is nice that it operates on the screenshot level. So we get the benefit on all three of our platforms at the same time without having to modify anything in the app individually. And it runs very quickly. So this is much more lightweight than a neural network solution and seems to work pretty well. Finally, let's move on to Diffbot. Diffbot is going to be a little bit different. We don't want to detect bugs with it like we did with ButtonBot. We want to identify that something has changed over time and then 
we'll let a person look at it to decide if there's anything actually going on that's a problem. Again, we want to operate on all three platforms at once so that we don't have to instrument anything in the app. And then I'm going to add here, I want this to be zero maintenance, and I'll explain that in the next slide. Let's consider a naive comparison. So in the left screenshot, this is the baseline. This is the screenshot from a previous week. And then on the right, we have the screenshot from the current week, which we're comparing to that. This screenshot is of one of our course materials. So it's asking, what is the, what is the Spanish word for the boy? And there's four options to choose from. And these images are displayed randomly each time the challenge is displayed. So in the previous week, the characters are laid out in a different order than in the current week, which means every time the screenshot is checked, it will be flagged as being different. Even though there's nothing wrong here, we expect this to be different. What we really want to do is cover this part up and ignore the characters that change every week and check the, things, the assets at the top and check the assets at the bottom. One manual solution could be that we just have a person go in and somehow indicate to the tool not to check the center, and the tool will just know to check the top and the bottom. But with 70,000 screenshots per week, this is just not feasible. We would have to go in and, and mark up 70,000 screenshots and identify what doesn't change and what does change. And then the code changes every week, the app changes every week, which means we have to constantly update these masks to, to work. And that's just not feasible for this kind of scale. Let's think about how we could automate this process. In bird's eye, we have the benefit of several months of history of a, a given screenshot. And so we could look at, let's say, the last three weeks of a screenshot and compare them to each other. And this is not yet including the candidate that we're testing. This is just the historical screenshots. Just by comparing these three, we can tell that the images in the middle are changing and that that's probably OK, and that the assets at the top and the bottom are not changing. So if we do essentially a diff of these three, we generate this mask where the character faces are going to be blocked off for being different. So this is a function in the scikit image Python library called structural similarity. Now, if we take this automated mask and apply it to the original screenshot in the baseline, we can cover up the parts that we expect to change and only the assets that aren't changing remain. So now when we compare the baseline to the candidate, this will not be flagged because we have appropriately covered up the things that we don't want to check. The screenshot on the left in this example is in grayscale because this is how the underlying code actually operates on the images. The candidate on the right is in color because I've just taken the original image and superimposed the results on top of it. So this is case one in what we call layout changes. The screen on the right, we can see that there's an extra part of the screen here, of the uh, drop down here. So the layout of this app has changed. And what this means is this screenshot will be flagged in every UI language for this screenshot because it is not a change to the text in a certain language, it is a change to how the app is displaying things. When we see that it's been flagged in every UI language, we can infer that this is a layout change as a result, and we can send it to the appropriate team just to eyeball this and make sure that it looks okay. This screen is showing a calendar for how many, time, how many days a week that the user has interacted with the app. And since this will change week to week, the mask is being properly generated. We can see the black boxes covering up the various dates in the calendar as those change week to week. So the blue box here is indicating that the diff tool has found a difference in the layout, and there's nothing in the calendar area. So we have properly covered that up, and uh, it is being ignored. Another interesting thing is these screenshots are taken at different times during the day as the pipeline runs. So the clock in the top of the OS here will be different with each screenshot. And as you can see in the baseline image, there is a mask covering up the clock as well. So the mask seems to be working and covering up things that are changing week to week that we don't really care about. The second case is the text changes. These are the ones where a localization team member has edited some string, and now there is a difference, and it'll be flagged on just one language instead of all of them. So in the left screenshot, the text says, pass, this test, pass the test to advance. And in, in the right screenshot, the text has been changed to pass this test to advance. So there's a slight change here, and the blue boxes are indicating that it has been detected, and it will be sent to a localization team member to eyeball rather than 
somebody who's going to be checking the layout. Here are some examples of bugs that this tool has found. In this Chinese screenshot, the text here has, has been changed and it's much longer now. And we can see that there's one character that has line wrapped, uh, which kind of looks, looks kind of ugly. So we can send this to the Chinese localization team and they can either try, sh try to shorten the text a little bit while maintaining the same uh, information, or we can send it to a developer and maybe they can increase the space for the box so that more text can be held before a line wrap. Here's a case of a bug where the, there was a call out in the left image for this uh, badge on the screen. And then in the current image in color on the right, the call out has, some, has somehow dropped down to the bottom and is really far away from the thing that it's calling out. So there's a blue box here to indicate that this is where the call out used to be. And then there's another box here that the diff tool has indicated for where there is something that's changed. And of course, when a person looks at this, they can identify that, yes, this is a bug and we should fix that. In this final example, this, is a, um, this was flagged on all UI languages, and the text has changed somehow so that rather than rendering the bold tags and making date, the word date, the text day 14 in bold, it just displays B with brackets around it. So it's displaying the tags instead of using them. As this was flagged in all languages, we were able to send this and have that fixed. And so this was, identi this was identifying properly that there's a bug here that we could fix. Now let's see how this tool is integrated with Birdseye's UI. In the left panel where the filters are, the bottom filter is called visual change. And there are two options, layout and string, representing the two cases that I just mentioned. When we zoom in on a screenshot, in addition to normal view and string ID view in the corner, there's also a split view. And if we select that, we can see there are now two screenshots on the screen, the previous week's screenshot and then the current week's screenshot. And there are boxes here to indicate what has changed between the two. In the, it, it's subtle to see, but in the left screenshot, the bottom of the text bubble is right around where Duo's elbow is. Whereas in the current week's screenshot, the text bubble starts maybe 10 or 20 pixels higher than that. So it's a very subtle change. It's not a bug. It's just that something has changed and is different, and that's being flagged. And the nice thing here is because of the automatic mask generation, next week this will not get flagged because the mask generation will automatically identify that this location of the, of the speech bubble has changed and automatically generate a mask to cover that up. So when the next screenshot is compared, this part will be covered up and it'll still be checking the rest of the screenshot for differences. In the end, we succeeded in our goal of zero maintenance. The mask generation is automatic. So there's no manual step of going in and check it and, and, and covering things up in 70,000 screenshots. So this is great. Again, we succeeded in having this run on three platforms. So it operates on the screenshots and there's no need to instrument the apps individually. There's a concern about false positives. For example, in the previous example with the speech bubble moving up, that can be interpreted in some ways as a false positive because it is a difference that be, that's being correctly flagged, but it's not a bug, so to speak. So it could be considered a false positive and we don't want those. On the other hand, I'd rather look at 50 diffbot flagged images than all 70,000 every week. So I think it's okay to have some false positives. The last consideration is that changes become part of the baseline. So in the previous example, it was okay because it wasn't a bug that it became, that it will become part of the baseline in subsequent weeks. However, if that were a bug and we didn't notice it that week, it would also become part of the baseline and be, and not be flagged in subsequent weeks. So there is a concern here that bugs can just become accepted as normal and then not flagged anymore. This is okay because we're identifying differences and not bugs necessarily, but it shows how important it is to have other tools such as ButtonBot that are definitively looking for bugs rather than differences. So to conclude, thanks to Sauce Labs, we're able to generate a lot of screenshots very easily. We have three projects for using those screenshots and extracting value from them, String ID, ButtonBot, and DiffBot. Thank you for your time. There are other people who have also worked on these projects. Pat Dalsas wrote the original Birdseye implementation. Yijing Chen wrote the integrations between the bird's eye UI and the diffbot and string ID tools. And there's also contact information for me here. Feel free to
contact us with questions or comments or whatever you have. Thank you for your time.